and somebody had a great idea. Let's let Sean have two for the price of one. <laughs> Seriously, he is doing a great service in Pennsylvania where they're asking some very challenging questions about how to do church in the 21st century. I'll say more about this tonight when Sean serves as our keynote speaker and I introduce him again. He also has served on Trek, looking at questions of uh, uh, how the church-wide systems need to change. And these are conversations that we're having here, uh, deep conversations about how we do God's mission in this place, uh, not in a, a preserve, conserve, protect mode, uh, but, but looking at it as a calling uh, to uh, joyfully uh, and proactively do God's mission in the way God would call us to do. And that's why Sean's here today, not because it's 14 degrees in Erie, Pennsylvania, and it is not here. And so, welcome, my friend. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you at this diocesan convention. Even more wonderful to have left four feet of snow and 14 degrees. I can't get any bishops to come to ear. <laughs> when I saw you were changing your diocesan convention or thinking of changing it to November, I don't think that would be nearly as attractive as February. But I make no judgment about what you decide to do here. I want to talk a, a bit about church and structure. Something that people will often say in the church, particularly clergy types, when we're talking about structure, we're really not talking about mission. We need to be talking about mission and forget all of this structure business. Except that structure helps to shape and form behavior. So I consider structure mission. Now, it could be that I'm one of those people who has a hammer so everything looks like a nail. <laughs> Having just completed a PhD in the area of organizational studies, because we have enough theologians, we need some people who know something about how organizations work. <laughs> and the church is an organization. It's a living organism. It's the body of Christ. That makes it unique. Now, I'm an unreformed summer camp believer, so let me just start there. There's nothing sophisticated about my theology, except that I understand the church to be the risen body of Christ in the world. That makes it different than a business. But all of the claims to exceptionalism that are made, the knee-jerk reaction to say, but we're not a business, but we're not a for-profit, all, all of it is true as far as it goes. But in fact, in addition to being the body of Christ in the world, a living organism, it's also an organization. Next to the military, one of the oldest bureaucracies in the world. It is designed, designed inherently, to resist change. It's part of the DNA. That's how we've been able to hand the faith down over generations. So it's not always a bad thing. But it's a particular challenge for us now. It's been a challenge for us throughout church history, but in this period, for at least the last 50 years, extremely difficult. And part of our issue as a church is the inability to tell the truth to each other about what's really happening inside the organization and in the structure. I want to talk a bit about that, say something about our organization as a church and our idea of reimagining the church. By the way, you've all read the, the Trek report. If you don't know what Trek is, it was a task force to reimagine the Episcopal Church. I'm sure you've read it and now understand that if all measures are adopted, the church will be better and will grow in leaps and bounds. All of our problems will be solved and we'll be back to proclaiming and doing gospel work. 
if you're slightly skeptical, as I am, and I was on the, the committee, you know, that it's, you know that it's a long road, that there are no quick fixes. And in a world that demands and loves the quick fix, we're in a church and there aren't any quick fixes. And if I could stand up here and tell you what the church of the 21st century looked like, I wouldn't be doing that. I would be holed up someplace, writing it, selling books, and retiring to the beaches of some exotic place like San Diego. <laughs> but the church has undergone tremendous change in the last 50 years. We all, we've all heard it. There are people making a living, making the circuit, telling us about how the culture shifted and all the excuses about how it's not our fault when it really is. In part, in part, letting us off our own hook isn't helpful, blaming us ourselves for things that aren't our fault or something else, but the church has changed dramatically. Does, does anyone know who this, this is the cover of Time magazine circa 1950. Does anyone know who that is on the cover? You are the first person in any group I've ever shown this to to know that you get the award. I don't know what it is, but you get it. This is, this is Henry Knox Sherrill. You don't know Henry, Henry Knox Sherrill. He was really the first presiding bishop in our kind of corporate structure as an Episcopal church. The first one to inhabit 815, what we kind of think of as uh, our corporate church when, when in the four, late 40s and 50s we were ramping up to that way of understanding the denomination. This is the front cover of Time magazine talking about the mainline Protestant church. So I, could never, I can't ever get this picture cropped quite, quite correctly. But if you look, there's Henry Knox Sherrill. There's a big cross in the background. And then what you see, if you, can, if you actually Google image this and look at it, you see throngs of people, which is you know, meant to look like the entire United States. Everybody who isn't a Roman Catholic is a mainline Protestant. Following this person who is, of course, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. This is the cover of Time magazine in 1950. Times have changed. <laughs> Most people wouldn't have any clue who the presiding bishop is. No one would ever, this, the, the ordination or the consecration, rather, the, the enthronement, whatever we want to call it, of the presiding bishop was on every newsreel, played everywhere. I mean, people wouldn't even give it a second thought today. This is the kind of change that we've undergone. And we've gotten stuck. Really, I believe, I mean, this, there are a number of theories, but I, I think that I can at least pinpoint the time of the special program of the Episcopal Church in the 1960s when we decided to take on the issue of race, most correctly and called by God to do so. We began, uh, uh, with the rest of the culture, uh, a seismic shift and change to the point where we really, we call ourselves mainline, but we aren't. So what about this and what does this have to do with, with the future? Well, I believe that we do not, do not have to settle for being a declining, dying church. And I've, I've said this other places, you may have seen me say, I, I think it's, it's worth saying. I think the idea that this church is in decline, that we can't do anything about it, that it's never going to get much better, and that what we're really going to have is a remnant of faithful people is a lie straight out of hell. I really believe that to be the case. And I speak that strongly about it because I think God is calling us to something that's new. But it would be good to think about what's going on with us and how we might capitalize on what's happening with us now to look toward the future. As we move from this modern corporate bureaucracy to a place where we're disestablished, if we ever really were, where we're on the outside and how we can reshape the nation from a missionary point and a missionary point of view 
rather than from the center. Not missionary, which has a negative connotation in many parts of the world as having, been imp having faith imposed upon people, but coming from the bottom up, reaching our mission from the bottom to the top, from a decentralized but networked church. We have a number of what I would call, what the, what the scholarship on organization calls organizational learning disabilities. <laughs> now see, learning disabilities are often forms, are kinds of genius as well. Interestingly, a lot of research on dyslexia is saying, well, what really is happening with people is they're seeing all combinations of a word rather than the word itself. It's a, it's a kind of genius in a way. But we often have to compensate and learn for, from them. But we're, we're in, the, in the boat of what we call the, the parable of the boiling frog. It's like you put the frog in the water that's cool, and you continue to turn it up slowly. If you, if you jerk the heat, the frog jumps out. But if you turn it up slowly enough, the frog is slowly but surely boiled in the water and doesn't even know that it's happening. I think it's helpful to look at other organizations to get a sense of our own. Everybody likes to pick on General Motors. And having a family who has worked, has spent life working for General Motors, I feel particularly qualified to do that. And living in the Rust Belt where many of the organizations that, that I serve and work with serve the car industry, who better to pick on? It didn't find itself in peril all of a sudden in 2007 when it decided to declare bankruptcy. But think about this, in 1950, they had 48% of the market share, almost one in two cars. There was nearly an antitrust lawsuit filed against GM because they almost had too much of the market share, one of two cars. By 1978, they, they were losing their market share. By 1990, they sold one in three cars. By 2007, one in four cars. The problem with a gradual crisis is that it's hard to get people motivated and mobilized to change. It happens so slowly over the course of time that people barely notice that it's happening. Think of, think of our own church. It's height at 1965 and its steady decline since then, and a kind of inability to motivate, to mobilize. What happened in the 1980s with General Motors is that they decided that they would automate, and they would spend a fortune automating. In fact, they spent $67 billion in excess of appreciated revenue to do that. Okay? Now, by the end of that decade, after spending $67 billion, there was only $26 billion of owner equity in General Motors. The market share fell from 44% to 35%, and what's interesting is that Toyota and Honda together were only worth $21 billion. So imagine if General Motors had simply acquired Toyota and Honda. They spent more to have one to two cars to one in three cars. Ross Perot was on the board in 1985, raising the flags and saying, this can't be. We're going down a road. Just like we've had people pop up all over the place and point this out to us. What have we done since 1965? Well, we have nearly a third more diocese than we did with fewer people, which means more bishops, more structure, mainly because we like to have our own. In this church, we are absolutely addicted to autonomy. We love it. Our parishes love to be autonomous. I'm the rector. Rector comes from the Latin rex, meaning 
ruler. <laughs> We're the vestry. The diocese, which of course isn't us, um, it's those other people. The diocese can't tell us. We're the vestry of the, the independent vestry, of the independent parish, of the diocese, which is also independent. The presiding bishop can't come and tell us what we should be doing, and the general convention might have nice ideas, but they're not binding on us because we're independent, even though we are all creations of a general convention. But what does this lead to? It leads to a sense that we are on our own, that we do it ourselves, that we'll compete with each other when what God is really calling us to in this time and in this place, I believe, is deep collaboration. Collaboration like we've not known it before. It's going to require us to work with each other in ways we've not worked with each other, to give up what heretofore has been sacred to us, our independence, to let go of some that we have for the sake of the future and investment in the future, to be, as God calls us, the body of Christ, truly and deeply interdependent. But what happens to us under these times of stress, even as the heat is being turned up slowly, is we gain a sense of learned helplessness. This idea that we don't have the power to change, that we perceive events as uncontrollable around us, and that we become pessimistic about our ability really to transform. And so we think the gospel message then is try harder instead of rely on God and God's grace. That we should try harder to do what we're already doing. And we become rigid in our response to the challenges around us. At the individual level, we begin to become rigid. At the group level, we engage in groupthink. Groupthink is not where everybody thinks the same thing. Groupthink is when we prematurely arrive at a conclusion or a solution to a problem. This is like the next new thing that comes down the road. We jump on it because it's going to solve the problem. And we really don't want to hear any dissenting points of view. So we've created an organization that doesn't want to hear the challenge. But we're being called in this time and in this place to do something new, which, re which requires us to be in communities where learning is appreciated, where various points of view are tolerated and accepted, and where we move to solution and move to action. I'll say more about that in a, in a few minutes. This other idea is that the enemy is out there. And that's what I really think. This, if you can't see this cartoon, it's a bunch of people meeting in a church, and the tagline is, church meetings are brilliant. This is where we focus on the idea that it's not anything we're doing internally, the enemy, or what's holding us back from living into the vision that God's calling us, or a new way, is something that's outside of us. So this is what I don't like about the culture critique. It's true as far as it goes, again, but is it really the culture outside the church that's the problem? So what we do is we try harder to make our internal culture or whatever we do inside work better and say, well, if people, if people were really committed to Jesus, they would, they would come to church or you know, these people, they don't really want to be disciples or, well, there's a, uh, there's a long weekend every month and so people don't come to church like they used to. So the idea is that the enemy's always outside. It's never really about us. Now, what if it was about us being challenged to excellence? and being accountable for results, and not simply saying things like, but we're growing spiritually. Which may be true. Nobody typically measures that. It's, it's usually anecdotal. 
But my question to that, we're, but, but, but we're, grow, we're, we're getting smaller, we're becoming a remnant, we can't support ourselves, we're not really living into the gospel mandate, but we're growing spiritually. Well, we can't judge a person's faith, but we can be fruit inspectors. <laughs> right. So what is the fruit of this growth spiritually that we continue to talk about? important, but what is the next step to the places that God is, is calling us? A focus on events. This is, a, this is a, another favorite of, of the church. Things that, that culminate in an event have a number of causes and a number of factors that lead to them. We typically take an event and usually one that we like and then begin to abstract from that event, as though that event is really what we're looking at rather than the root causes. Uh, focus on events is, is a favorite because in the church we love to tell a story. People don't like to argue the merits often. We think that a narrative will be enough, that we don't necessarily need the data, that if we can just look at the story itself, at a larger level, that will be enough. This focus on events keeps us from processes that actually address the issues we want to address. The other is the delusion from learning from experience. How many times have you been told in your life when you fail? Well, you need, what you, if the important thing is that you learn from the failure. Except that we don't as a church. I mean, I think in some pretty significant ways. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how all of these can be remedied, which is the important part, but let me, let me say something about this delusion from learning from experience. The best example I can think of in relatively recent times is the decade of evangelism. Anybody remember the decade of evangelism from the 90s? Interesting. God called us to that. It was, it was, it was a powerful, spirit-filled vision. What, does anybody know what happened with the decade of evangelism? I mean, the church really didn't grow. It, there was a blip in the early 2000s. It's hard to say. Here's my problem with the decade of evangelism. Not that it failed. I think it, it's, it's really kind of a powerful, spirit-filled vision. I've said that. The problem I have with it is... We have no idea what the results of the decade of evangelism were really. No one has really issued any kind of report or study that said, why didn't it work? So we had no idea why the decade of evangelism didn't work for us. No idea. But does anybody remember what happened early in the 2000s at General Convention? What was the vision adopted next? 2020. The 20, how many people in here know what the 2020 vision is? Really, there's, I, I'd say there's 10 to 15 hands up in here. General Convention adopted a full-scale vision and strategic plan called 2020. The idea was to double the church by 2020. I used to put a graph up here to show people that it's, it's done this. Why? We didn't learn from the decade of evangelism. But we went right from the decade of evangelism to 2020. There are no institutional structures that allow us to learn. Failure is typically penalized. It's not incentivized in the church at all, particularly for clergy. Great way to... to kill a career or find yourself on the other side of the pension fund issues. It doesn't necessarily work for a congregation or for an organization of any kind that's fragile. It's hard to learn from failure if we don't look at what it is. And most importantly, we rarely live with the consequences of the decisions we make. 
Many of the things that we live with now in the church are the consequence of decisions that were made as long as 20, 30 years ago. So it's hard to learn when our learning horizon is so short, but there are ways to overcome this. The illusion of taking charge, being proactive is in vogue. We don't want to be seen as reactive. But often, proactivity is simply reactivity in disguise. And it's hard to sometimes distinguish whether we're being proactive, really, or reactive. I mean, if we're aggressive against an enemy, for example, is that proactive or reactive? It's sometimes hard to tell. True proactivity comes from seeing how we contribute to our own problems and are a product of thinking and not an emotional state. And I talked about our obsession with independence. What we're missing as a church is basic research and development. I was just talking with your bishop uh, about this. We don't have an R&D department at all. What I think is incredible is that you're setting aside or considering setting aside $100,000 for new initiatives. But we don't have any research and development going on, really, to speak of. We have some people trying a few things, but they are not connected. So they're not connected to any kind of network. So then it's impossible to know whether they work or not, or what works about them or not. And so then what we tend to do is play the context card, which is our favorite card to play, context. But you don't know my context. It's like a trump card. Throw it down, and you can't play against it. You don't know my context. Well. What can we learn from what's been, what you're doing, regardless of the context? It requires empirical data, which we don't like to collect. We want to tell you a story about how well it worked, but we typically don't have the data. What if we really got serious about research and development and experimentation in the church? Experimentation is going to be the key to the future. People say to me, why in the world would you go from having, being the bishop of one diocese to taking on another one? Why would you do that? Well, I thought I needed to put my money where my mouth is. The fact of the matter is, we may have too many dioceses in the church. I mean, I really don't know the answer to that. Do we need 100-plus domestic dioceses? I don't know. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. How would, how would we know? So we've got people opinion, opining that we have too many, that we don't have enough. But who studied it to know? Who's really looked at it? Other than whether you think there are too many or not. We have to experiment to see what other arrangements are there. What kind of experiments can we undertake? So I'm bishop of two dioceses and trying to live into the episcopate in a different way. Will it work? It's hard to say. Do I have to cross another diocese to get to where I'm going? Yes. <laughs> Does that make any real sense? No, except it's hard to have conversations about it and in the largest resistance in the conversations that I've been having amongst dioceses about working together is we want our own. We want our own. It's not what would be best for the gospel, what would be the best mission strategy, it's we want our own. Well, yes, I want my own. Everybody wants their own. What's best for the mission strategy of the gospel? Is it 100 more dioceses? Is it 50 less? Is it something else? We don't know because we're busy trying to maintain what we have, but 
we're being called to something new, and I'm, I am encouraging and calling on you, and your bishop is, to experiment. And exper- with experimentation comes failure. I can tell you that in my eight years as a diocesan bishop and in the many experiments we have done, most have failed. And some at great expense financially and more importantly to people. Because I'm in a part of the world that isn't growing at all. In fact, it's declining in huge numbers. In the Diocese of Northwestern Pennsylvania, there's not a single growing community, not one. But I still believe the churches can grow. Why? Because half of the people are not claimed by any tradition. And that is our gospel field, but it's going to require experimentation and risk-taking. I was just reading about a failure conference that happens every year in in California. It's interesting, I watched some of the talks from the failure conference. They they put up what are like the equivalent of TED Talks. But, you know, the end of them are always about how after they failed. Like, nobody ever just lost everything for something they loved. They always lost everything, but then somehow now they're multimillionaires or they, they turned into something else. I mean, it's interesting how they all have to end with a success. It can't just be we didn't, we didn't cut it. And that's the way that it is. But some, in some times and in some places in the church, that will be okay. But experimentation, systems thinking, and I don't just mean for the clergy types, and I don't just mean uh, Bowen family systems or reading Ed Friedman's unfinished uh, theory about family systems. I'm talking about really thinking about how organizations integrate within themselves and the ways in which we can network ourselves, which is really how I'm beginning to see dioceses as hubs of networks, highly structured, but structured for creativity. For example, all of you live in California, so Google and and Apple are on your radar in in an up-close and personal way. These are companies that sure try to keep people at work 17 hours a day. But they're often places that are kind of idealized as creative centers, as places where people come and go and and work, but they're highly structured to foster that creativity. What I'm wondering is can we shed enough of our current structure as it is and and replace it with structure that fosters experimentation and creativity and research and development. And how would we do that? Scale. We talk a lot about having a critical mass. You know, we want to have a youth group, but it's hard to get a critical mass. But if we work together, we can. I'm wondering the ways in which dioceses across the board, and parishes and congregations within a diocese can begin to create scale by collaboration. Real critical mass. Do we need a finance officer in every single diocese? Is there a way that we can share? That's a really technical small end. But what about across parishes? And what about within a diocese? What are the ways that we can create enough scale that we know how to scale a project that's working, an experiment that's working, and scale it up instead of allowing it to stand alone? When we find something that works, God could call us to, and we are called to, make it known, make that good news known. Really, organizationally, we're talking about scaling it up. Our interdependence, getting away from autonomy, which I spoke about. The other, and it usually annoys people, is less leadership and more management. We had enough vision, I think. I think the scripture lays out a pretty compelling vision. It's good for us to have vision and mission statements, not opposed to them, not saying that we shouldn't dream and articulate them as groups of leaders, but the management of the skills in getting it done and the operationalization of these brilliant ideas that we have and the ways of putting together the right kinds of experiments. 
So I think we are in a church that's overled and undermanaged. I'm not talking about we all become middle managers who really make organizations run, let me tell you. I'm not suggesting that that's all of our call, but our call to manage this creativity that's been put in our laps will be crucial for the future. And an examination of our mental models. You know, General Motors had this idea that a car is a status symbol and that it was the styling that mattered, not the quality of the vehicle. And you can see how well that worked. <laughs> but they, they had a hard time letting go of that mental model. And so what are our mental models of the church, of a diocese, of a congregation, and how do we step outside of those? And I believe that God is calling us to do just that to step outside and embrace the creativity and the experimentation which is inbuilt in us, in us who are generous people called to serve God and to make the good news of the gospel known to the world. I want to stop there briefly because this is to be a workshop. I didn't, wasn't expecting to have quite so uh, many many folks here, and I'm glad that you are, and to, to have some conversation about this, hard to have a conversation and with a, a group this big, but for some to, to offer thoughts uh, before I say a few more words. Are there thoughts or comments or questions that you might have to, to move us along?